starting a new sermon series this week called Simply Jesus. And uh, I couldn't think of a more fitting hymn to start this worship uh, with a theme like that. So I uh, hope you enjoyed it. I know it's one that we all enjoy singing together when we're in the sanctuary together. Um, so hopefully, maybe you're singing along wherever you are this morning. Let us pray. Dear loving and holy God, thank you for a new day. Thank you for another chance to hear your word. Please open our hearts and minds so that we can hear your message and feel your presence. Help us to remember that you are with us every moment of every day. Amen. I love this series that Clay is doing on Simply Jesus because in the midst of a pandemic that seems to be growing exponentially every day and so many things that are uncertain, Jesus is constant. And I keep going back to that song, that old song. What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. As we gather this morning, I just want to remind you that one of the ways that we connect to Jesus is through Scripture. And so pick up your Bible this week, open it up and turn to these words as a source of comfort and trust that Jesus will meet you here. Today's readings come from the book of Luke. We're going to start in Luke chapter 4, verses 16. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him, and they were amazed 
at the gracious words that came out of his mouth. Let's move to Luke chapter 6, verse 27 through 31. But I say to you that listen, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. If anyone strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from anyone who takes away your coat, do not withhold even your shirt. Give to everyone who begs from you. And if anyone takes away your goods, do not ask for them again. Do to others as you would have them do to you. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Good morning, Woodmont. We were hoping uh, to be able to have uh, some indoor services today, but when Nashville uh, moved back to phase two, we've uh, pushed that back for now. So we're sticking with uh, online and our drive-in service, which is now at nine o'clock, and we will uh, let you know uh, as soon as we feel like we're ready to offer something inside. Uh, Join with me for a word of prayer as we begin. Loving God, open our hearts and minds to hear your word. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. You are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I want to begin this morning by expressing my uh, heartfelt gratitude um, for the prayers, the cards, the emails, the texts, the phone calls, the food, the visits, um, and all the, uh, the love and support that this church family uh, showed our family uh, while Montgomery and I were sick um, and while we were struggling with uh, coronavirus. Um, I was simply overwhelmed uh, by the love and support of uh, Woodmont and um, also just our friends in Nashville in general. And so um, I just want you to know that you all helped us get through a very uh, difficult uh, couple of weeks. And so I want to begin this morning by saying uh, thank you. Uh, Truly, uh, thank you so much. Uh, It wasn't fun. Um, It was challenging. I started off with uh, fairly mild symptoms and sent a couple of videos out. But then things got a little more complicated as uh, as time went on. Um, My oxygen levels were not great. Uh, I couldn't breathe very well without constantly coughing. And uh, for a few days, I was convinced that I would end up in the hospital just so I could uh, have some help breathing. But thankfully, uh, that didn't happen. And we made it through. And I just want you to know that your prayers and your support made such a big difference. And um, our family uh, is truly, truly grateful. Today, we're beginning a new summer sermon series that is called simply Jesus. With everything that has happened in the year 2020, it's occurred to me that we need to intentionally ground ourselves in the person, work, and teachings of Jesus Christ. We cannot deal with the ongoing uh, coronavirus pandemic, which has actually grown worse here in Nashville, with the racial tension, the political discord, the cancel culture, and anything else that is happening right now, if we don't first look to Christ as our guide. Because as Christians, he must inform us how we are to think, how we are to live, how we are to act, and how we are to treat each other. The summer after I graduated from college, from TCU, uh, I lived out west. I actually lived out there for three summers, but I was living out west, summer of 2002, I was preparing to uh, go to a seminary at Princeton in the fall, and I was working at a restaurant in Vail Village, uh, which was a fun place called Pazzo's, a uh, pizzeria. Uh, Pazzo's means Italian. Uh, it's Italian for crazy. It's the word for crazy, so it's kind of a wild spot. But it was a Friday night, I think, and I was waiting tables, and I was waiting on this table of folks from New York City or maybe New York State, I can't recall. But we were having a great conversation, if I 
remember they left me a, a nice tip. I mean, who wouldn't want to tip a uh, incoming seminary student, right? They'd ask me what I was doing after college. I told them I was going to seminary. We talked about faith. We talked about Christianity. We talked about the church. And, um, and I remember that night, the table got up to leave, but one of the guys from that table walked to the back of the restaurant and he found me. And he kind of grabbed me by the arm and he said, Clay, I want you to remember something. I want you to remember that there is a big difference between knowing about God and actually knowing God. Well, as Christians, I would argue that the way that we know God is by knowing Jesus Christ. And there's a big difference between knowing about Jesus Christ versus actually knowing Christ. Lots of people know about Jesus, but that's not the same thing as knowing Jesus. People know that he lived, they know that he healed, they know that he taught, but far fewer people, even in the Christian world, actually know Jesus on a personal level. Well, what does it mean to know about Jesus? Well, my uh, Methodist friend, Adam Hamilton, wrote a book on the Apostles' Creed, and in the section uh, on Christ, he gives an, an overview, a snapshot of Jesus' life. This is what he says. Jesus was born in Bethlehem around 4 BC in the Roman province of Judea when King Herod was the king. Shortly after his birth, his family moved to Nazareth, a small village largely made up of peasants or working class people. Jesus' parents were Mary and Joseph. And Joseph was a carpenter and possibly a stonemason as well. And Jesus, too, uh, became a carpenter. There is very little found in the Gospels about Jesus' youth. According to Luke's Gospel, we know that at one point his parents left him behind in Jerusalem. And when they realized it and they came back to find him, they found him in the temple uh, teaching and listening uh, to the Jewish rabbis. The primary focus of the gospel is on the final three years of Jesus' life. Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist in the Jordan River. After his baptism, we're told that he goes into the wilderness to be with God for 40 days where he is tempted by the devil. According to Luke, when Jesus begins his ministry, he quotes the words of Isaiah in our text for this morning. We find these words in Luke chapter four. He says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. That's Luke 4, 16 through 19. Jesus's ministry was marked by his compassion for the sick, the marginalized, and those who were lost. He, he taught in basic stories that we call parables. Jesus' best known ethical teaching is a compilation of things that he said in what we call the Sermon on the Mount. And you can find that in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And then Luke has a version in chapter 6 that we call the Sermon on the Plain. He summarized God's demands for his people with two basic commandments. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. He says, on these two things hang all the law and the prophets. From the very beginning, Jesus found himself at odds with the religious authorities. They were threatened by his large following. They didn't know what to make of his healings and his miracles. Jesus was never afraid to call out the religious leaders. He had a problem with their legalism. Jesus' words and actions set him on a collision course with the authorities, and things reached a breaking point during the third year of his public ministry when Jesus entered Jerusalem a week before Passover. According to Adam Hamilton, he says, Jesus was not concerned with overthrowing the Romans. He understood that God's kingdom existed wherever people put their trust in God and sought to love God and love their neighbor. He taught them that the kingdom of God is among them and within them. In this kingdom, Jesus said, people not only love God and their neighbor, but they also love their enemies. They feed the hungry, they clothe the naked, they visit the sick and those who are in prison. In this kingdom, Hamilton says, the, the truly great act as servants 
and humility is a cardinal virtue. The people's hosannas on Palm Sunday as he entered Jerusalem reflected a desire for Jesus to save them from Pilate, to save them from the Romans. But what they didn't realize is that Jesus had come to save them, but not from the Romans. He came to save them. He came to save us from ourselves. The enemy that he sought to deliver them from was the hate and the indifference and the pride and the hypocrisy in each and every human heart what the Bible refers to as sin. And the resulting alienation from God and neighbor is, is what sin results in. He came to save them from fear and lovelessness and hopelessness and ultimately from death itself. Jesus was betrayed by his disciples. He was handed over to Pontius Pilate. He was falsely tried. He was given a crown of thorns. He was mocked. He was beaten. He was nailed to a cross to be executed. He died. He was buried, but then three days later, the tomb was empty because Jesus was raised, which is what we celebrate on Easter Sunday. Now that gives us a snapshot of this question, what does it mean to know about Jesus, about Jesus's life? But the question that I really wanna drive home in this new sermon series is what does it mean to know Jesus? on a personal level. What does it mean to let him change your heart, uh, change your mind, change the way that you live and the way that you treat people? Lots of people know about Jesus. He, he's probably the most famous uh, historical figure of all time, but far few, fewer people actually know him as a living presence. And, and so I wanna respond today to this question, what does it mean to know Jesus with three basic statements to begin the series? The first one is this, Jesus is very much concerned with the state and the condition of our heart. See, back in the first century, everything religious was about laws and rules and rituals. The 10 commandments were given to Moses on Mount Sinai. That was the heart of the law. Everybody knew it. We know what these 10 are. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol. You shall not take the Lord's name in vain. Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Honor your father and your mother. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not covet. So everything was built around the law and the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they were experts in the law. But Jesus says, no, it's not just about following the law. It's about your heart and your motive. It's why you do what you do. That's why in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, you've heard that it was said, you shall not murder. But I say to you, if you're angry with a brother or sister, you'll be liable to judgment. He says, you've heard that it was said you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. You've heard that it was said an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I say to you, turn the other cheek and, and go the extra mile. You've heard that it was said you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say to you, love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you. You see, Jesus is concerned with heart and motive and not just with rules, not just with law. The things that cause us to break the rules in the first place, it's a matter of the heart. And that's what we have to pay attention to as we're trying to follow Christ. Our heart, our motive, our intentions. Jesus is concerned with what's going on in the heart. Secondly, if you want to know Jesus and if you want to follow Jesus, then you must understand that Jesus cared about the poor and he calls us to care about the poor. At the beginning of his ministry in Luke chapter four, he says, I repeat, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. Now that doesn't mean that he didn't care about the rich but he did have a preferential place in his heart for the poor. Why? Because they were his people. 
You see, Jesus was from Nazareth and Nazareth was a peasant village that was full of poor people. And so Jesus knew them and Jesus loved them and Jesus would speak on their behalf. He knew how hard their life was. He also knew that they were often taken advantage of through the systems, through heavy taxation and the like. And many of them did not have a voice. You know, there's perhaps no greater divide in our culture than socioeconomics. And you can't talk about race, which is what we've been talking about a lot this summer in this country. You can't talk about race without also talking about socioeconomic class. Money and wealth give people opportunities and options that others simply don't have. And in our culture, there are so many different levels of wealth And some people have opportunities that others only dream of having. But to understand who Jesus was, you must understand that he cared for the poor. And he challenges us with whatever means we have to care for the poor. Now we can argue about how to best do that, how we best put that into action, but we simply cannot argue with the fact that Jesus calls us to care for the poor. Do you remember the story of Jesus and Zacchaeus that we find later in Luke uh, chapter 19? Jesus is entering uh, Jericho and a big crowd is gathered and Zacchaeus was this short, rich guy, a tax collector, who was pretty much despised by the people. He climbed up in a a sycamore tree so he could get a glimpse of Jesus. And when Jesus sees this, he says, Zacchaeus, you come down because I'm going to your house today. I'm going to your house to get to know you and to visit with you. And all the people, they were amazed because Jesus was, was dining with this tax collector. But what happens? You see, Jesus changes Zacchaeus' heart. We don't really know exactly what he said or how he did it, but what we do know is that once Jesus had visited with Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus comes out and says, half of what I have, I'll give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone, and chances are he had, then I will pay them back four times as much. Jesus had a special place in his heart for the poor, and he calls us to do the same. He says, just as you did it to one of the least of these, you did it unto me. Lastly, this morning, the third point that I wanna make in regards to this question, what does it mean to know Jesus? It means understanding that the kingdom of God is very, very different from the kingdoms of this world. And the challenge for all of us is that we have to live in both. And that's not always easy. Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. Adam Hamilton says, in this kingdom, Jesus said people not only love God and their neighbor, but they they love their enemy. They feed the hungry, clothe the naked, and visit the sick and those in prison. Citizens of this kingdom practice forgiveness rather than seek revenge. In this kingdom, the truly great act is servants and humility, humility is a cardinal virtue. To know Jesus means that we recognize that we are called to live our lives differently, humbly, compassionately, truthfully, courageously, mercifully. To know Jesus means that we must try to understand the pain and the hurt that other people are going through. And then we have to do our best to help them. We do our best to not let them struggle alone. Everybody's got pain. Everybody has challenges. Everybody has things in life that they are dealing with, and especially in a year like this. But Christ is reminding us that we don't have to deal with these things alone. We have each other. We have a community. Knowing Jesus on a deep level will not leave you the same because when you look around, you'll start to see how much pain and hurt there is in the world and you'll want to do everything in your power the best you can to match that pain with love and compassion and mercy and support. And guess what? That'll change you. That won't leave you the same. 
And no, it's not easy because there will always be more people to help. There will always be more pain to address. But knowing Jesus will give you a reason and a purpose to live your life. And in the coming weeks, we're going to keep talking about how we can live our lives the way that Jesus calls us to live our lives, how we can get to know Jesus on a personal level and then allow him to change our hearts so that we can then go and change the world. There's so many hymns uh, that, that are just beautiful and they talk about uh, our relationship with Christ and who he is and what he calls us to do and, and, to, and to be. But I wanna close with the words of, uh, of a great hymn that's called, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. And I'll leave you with these words. What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged, but take it to the Lord in prayer. Can we find a friend so faithful who will all our sorrows share? Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Jesus Christ will challenge us and change us. He will comfort the afflicted and he will afflict the comfortable. And in the coming weeks, that's what we're going to talk about. Amen.
Sisters and brothers in Christ, would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for all of my sisters and brothers in Christ. And I thank you for the reason that we can call each other sisters and brothers. I thank you for the tie that binds and for the kinship that we share, for the truth that we are one family in Christ Jesus our Lord, by his blood which washes us clean from sin, which gives us entry into your family and a place at your dinner table that can never be taken away from us. We thank you, O oh God, for the family of God, that we are included in it, that we have a number in it. Lord, we thank you. And Lord, I pray today that you would be with all of my sisters and brothers, wherever they may be, Lord, I ask that you would take care of them. Whatever hardships they are carrying, whatever worries or fears they have, whatever keeps them up at night, Lord, I pray that you would take care of them. And Lord, I pray that you would give them a sense of your presence. Let them feel you. Let them know that you are near, that you are with them, that you are for them. Lord, I pray that you would uh, remind them of the truth that you will never leave us or forsake us. Lord, we pray that you would remind us of this daily, hourly, if you must, but let us know it, not just in our minds, but deep down in our hearts. Lord, I pray for all those who are sick, for all those who are dying, for all those who are mourning the loss of a loved one. Be with them now, pull them close to you, wrap your loving arms around them, and let them know that you love them. Lord, we make our prayer today in the great and holy name of Jesus Christ, who taught all of his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I once heard about a wealthy man who enjoyed all of the luxuries and pleasures of life that you can imagine. There was nothing he wanted that he couldn't afford. And one day his church let it be known that they were in need of a piano. So the man thought to himself, why not? And not only did he buy them a piano, but he bought them a beautiful baby grand piano. And that magnificent piano greatly enhanced their worship music as well as their fellowship and their dinners. A few years later, due to a sudden economic reversal, the man lost everything. He became totally bankrupt. But he still loved to go to his church and hear the beautiful, soul-stirring, heartwarming music from that baby grand piano. And he couldn't help but think to himself that everything he had kept for himself he had lost, but what he had given to the Lord, he still had and continued to enjoy. 
It reminded him of the words of Jesus when he said, do not store up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust consume and thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourself treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not consume and where thieves do not break in and steal. Let us worship now by bringing what we want to give to the Lord. Would you pray with me? Lord, please accept the treasures that we hope to store up in heaven, our time, our talents, our love, and even our offerings. May we have the wisdom of knowing that what we keep for ourselves we will sooner or later lose, but what we give to you is ours to enjoy forever. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In one of the books that I'm reading, a man tells about how his father taught him to sail when he was a boy. And his father said, whenever you encounter a storm, make sure you head your boat right into the storm. Don't try to turn or avoid it or somehow get around it. Isn't that same advice true with life itself? Whenever we face a storm, whether it be sadness, sorrow, disappointment, sickness, tragedy, whatever, we shouldn't try to ignore it or try to run from our trouble, but we should head right into it, deal with it, lay it on the table, so to speak. And what better table could we lay it on than the table of the Lord's Supper where we share together in Holy Communion. So whatever fears or worries or sorrows you're dealing with right now, bring them to the table of the Lord's Supper. Talk to the Lord. Be still and listen to what the Lord might have to say. Be still and, and feel God's presence with you and the peace that that brings. And if you do so, you will discover that your worries, your fears, your sorrows will be replaced by faith and hope and love. Would you pray with me? Lord God, as we come to this table now and as we eat of the, the bread, uh, the bread of eternity, the cup of eternal life, a way in which we also open ourselves to receive your spirit into our lives, uh, representing this by the bread and the cup. We pray that you will give us the peace that only you can give. And when life is difficult or our troubles seem so great, that you will give us the strength we need, the patience we need, and always the hope that there's nothing too great for us to handle with your help. Lord, May your spirit now come in us. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. As we share together now with whatever elements of communion you may have with you, let us remember what Jesus said the night before he was crucified when he took the loaf of bread and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples and he offers it to us today saying, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then he took the cup of wine on the table and after blessing it and giving thanks for it, he gave it to his disciples and offers it to us today, saying, this is the new covenant in my blood. Do this, renew that covenant as often as you drink from the cup in remembrance of me. Amen.
Again, it's great to be back in worship. Um, thank you again for all the prayers and support over the past few weeks. Um, and we will continue to watch what's going on with uh, COVID-19, the cases in Nashville. And um, for now, worship uh, here online and worship uh, at the drive-in service and then pay attention to the newsletters for uh, things that are, that are coming up. Uh, let's prepare for our benediction. Go forth now and live, leaving your worries, your fears, your troubles, your sorrows behind. Take in their place faith and hope and love, for these are the gifts from Christ to all of you. Amen.